The idea behind culling is that you're cutting out trees that you don't intend to use or sell, but they're trees that are in your way for one reason for another. This beach in front of us was culled about 12 years ago. We did a timber sale out here 12 years ago, and I had this, I marked this tree to be culled. The loggers didn't want the firewood from it, so they, they double girdle it. They made that, that uh, double cut you see in the center there, and that prevented the flow of, of nutrients uh, up and down the tree, and it eventually killed it. And by doing that, what we did was we helped this hard maple here, or I'm sorry, this soft maple, and we helped that hard maple, and we helped that hard maple, and there's a couple of trees behind me that the crown of this beach was shading. Here in New York State, trees compete for sunlight more than anything else. So one thing, if it seems wasteful to you about killing a tree that you're not going to use, you can see how there's little homes for wildlife. There's a little critter bored in over there. Some woodpeckers probably bored in there. And the higher up the trees you, tree you go, you find more little apartments for wildlife. So that's another consideration. These standing dead trees do serve a purpose. For wildlife. I have a beech tree here that I want to get on the ground. There's an opening between a couple of trees over there. I'm going to follow it right like that. So I'll show you the way professional loggers use uh, to directionally fell their tree. The old school way of making your first cut would be to make your cut flat and then you come down from the top. Now that method of doing it dates back to the old time crosscut, two man crosscut days where they make their flat cut and then they'd use an axe to make their notch that way. Um, there's a better way to do it. What you do is your first cut is nearly vertical. See, a lot of people think that the notch on your, on your felling cut is to overbalance the tree so they'll make a great big cut way into the tree thinking that the notch is to overbalance it. That's not what it's for. What you're looking to do is to create a hinge, a flat hinge that will hold the tree to its stump as it goes down to the ground, and that will guide it on its way. Uh, if the tree is free of the stump, then it can go whichever way it wants. It can roll, it can kick, it can do any number of things. So what you're trying to do is create hinge wood and see it all the way to the ground. So again, we're coming in nearly vertical. We're using the handle of the chainsaw as our gun sight, point which way the tree's going down. my next cut, I want to make the notch 90 degrees. That way the tree will stay connected all the way to the ground. If I were to make a 45 degree notch, the way a lot of people do, when the tree is halfway to the ground, it'll actually pry itself off of the stump and then it could, again, it could kick or jump or whatever. So what I'm doing is, as I make my cut, I am sighting down the kerf of my first cut so that the two cuts meet exactly. That's really all you need. This tree has a bit of a lean already. It's rare to find a tree that stands absolutely plumb. So the next cut that I make, I want to make a plunge cut. I'm taking the tip, I'm going to plunge it in parallel to my hinge. I want to go about an inch, an inch and a half in from the hinge and just push it in straight. Now this part of the tip will kick if that is the first one that comes in contact with the tree. So 
So I'm actually coming in contact with this at a, an oblique angle. I push it in slightly, then I make it go straight and push it in. When you're making these cuts, you want to anchor it on your knee, on your hip. Just don't rely on your arms to make all the moves. Uh, that'll just burn you out in a hurry. Okay, I turned down the sound of the chainsaw. I don't need to blow your ears out. I just wanted to talk about some things as I work here. Uh, I changed my mind about the angle of attack for my plunge cut. I actually began with the top of the bar going in rather than the bottom of the bar like I said I would. I think I got a little self-conscious of pointing my rear end at the camera. Uh, you notice how I'm fully decked out in safety gear. I have my Kevlar chaps on, my hard hat with hearing protection, a full face shield. In my career I've met plenty of loggers who were missing fingers and toes and were deaf as a post. Uh, I learned from them. I use all the stuff I can. Those Kevlar chaps supposedly will stop a saw. I've, I've actually seen demonstrations where the, the long strands that run up and down will, will stop a saw before it can cut in your skin, so they're well worth wearing. You'll get a heck of a bruise, I guess, but it'll save your life. You won't bleed out in the woods. Um, the saw that I'm running here is actually way underpowered for a tree this size, especially a hardwood like beech. Uh, I often run small saws while I'm, while I'm doing this kind of work. When, when you're girdling trees, like I showed earlier, you don't need to cut that far in. And a small saw is lighter and easier to carry, so you won't get as tired while you're working. On this particular job, the landowner wanted to use uh, the beach for firewood. He asked me to get as many trees on the ground as I could. Uh, plus, just for filming purposes, it's more fun to watch me cut a bigger tree down than the little one. There, there are bigger trees than this, but it would have taken me all afternoon to fell one with a small saw. Now, the bar of this saw is, uh, was not quite long enough to pass all the way through the tree, so that's why I'm coming at it from two, two sides. In theory, you can cut a tree that's uh, two and a half times as wide as the bar of your chainsaw is long. Uh, and you can come at it from either side like this, and if you, in a pinch, you can actually bore into the hinge wood and hollow it out that way as well. But that uh, loggers who cut in in stands that have really large trees just tend to run long bars. It's easier that way. Um, this this saw is really taking a while to get through there. I think I might stop it here and speed it up a little. So you can see what I've done there. There's my notch. I've plunge cut and cut towards the rear of the tree, putting a wedge on either side of it. That'll keep the tree from wanting to settle onto the bar of the saw as I cut. So right now, the only thing holding this tree to the ground is the hinge wood and this bit of wood between here and here. That's all that's holding the tree up, and that's all it takes to hold the tree up. I can go have lunch right now, leave the tree, and it'll be safe. Uh, it would take a pretty big wind to blow it down right now. But the, the beauty of this way is that I can come and make one comparatively small nip right here, and that'll send the tree down to the ground. Now, if this tree... Uh, if I make that cut completely and the tree remains standing, all I have to do is encourage it by pounding the wedges on either side. It's got a, it's a big heavy tree. It, uh, it's got a bit of a lean. I think it'll start going once I make that cut. Right here I'm looking for hanging limbs that might want to fall straight on me once a tree starts falling. It's called a Widowmaker.
Also, at one point, you'll see me look to my right. I'm checking for an avenue of escape so I can get out of Dodge once the tree starts tipping. Right down the pipes. Yippee Don't anybody fool you, it's fun cutting trees down. <laughs> 